Our book, The Science of Learning, covers some of the key studies that have a big impact on how students think, feel and behave. It includes research on memory, metacognition and motivation and much more. It also gives tips for teachers on how they can use these research findings in their classroom. Now we've been really touched by the high praise that the science of learning has had by all who've read it. This has included head teachers, teachers, researchers and SENCOs. At Inner Drive, we think that there's a whole world of research out there if you know where to look. And truth be told, we could probably talk about this stuff for days. But what I thought I'd do in this video is along with my colleague Edward Watson, is share with you five of our favorite studies from the book and give you a bit of an overview of them. So let's get started with our first study. This one looks at how do we help students develop their resilience. Let's have a look at study number one. Recently, the leading resilience researchers in the country published a very important and thorough study. In it, they summarised some of the key tips and strategies to help people develop their resilience. The part that really stood out for me is the part about the environment, because that's the bit that the schools have the most control over. So what does this look like in practice? Well, challenges about setting a bar high in terms of behaviour and standards, and support includes students knowing who to turn to for help or advice. So, if we create an environment that is low in challenge and low in support, then not much tends to happen there. Students tend to stagnate. If we create an environment that's high in challenge but low in support, then maybe short term that high expectation can improve performance, but long term it's unsustainable, it's relentless and it eventually leads to burnout and stress. If we create an environment that is low in challenge but very high in support, then that's really, really nice. It's lovely, it's comfortable, and there's nothing wrong with sometimes being in that box, but we do have to acknowledge that it's unlikely that high performance happens there. Whereas if we create an environment that's high in challenge and high in support, that's the sort of environment where resilience can flourish. So let's take a moment to reflect. Where would you place yourself on this two by two matrix? How high do you set the bar for each and every student in terms of challenging work? And how supportive is your classroom environment? And most importantly, which can you do better and how? Now the next study is my favourite study on retrieval practice. Now most people don't have a favourite retrieval practice study, but this is definitely mine. Now retrieval practice is the act of generating an answer to a question, and this often takes the form of quizzes. In study number two, we look at how effective is retrieval practice compared to other techniques such as rereading your notes. Let's have a look at study number two. The way this study works is it divided students into one of three groups. The first group, they got to read the core text four times before they took their final exam. The second group, they got to read the core text three times before they then did some retrieval practice in the form of a quiz and then they took their final exam. The third group, they got to read the core text once and then they did three quizzes, so three rounds of retrieval practice and then they did their final exam. Now, as the students were essentially walking into the exam room, the researchers stopped them and asked them, how effective do you think your revision strategy was? How confident do you feel going into this exam? And what they found is given the choice, most students prefer to do the rereading. Rereading is safe, it's comfortable, it doesn't force you to confront what you do and don't know, so you never feel dumb during it. And yet, when we compared their exam results, we see the exact opposite trend. And those who'd done the retrieval practice more did better in their final exams. Now I take two things from this experiment findings. The first is that blue bar graph on the right hand side which indicates just how effective retrieval practice is, which probably tells me we need to weave it into our practice as much as possible. So what does retrieval practice look like on a day-to-day -day basis? How do we get students generating more answers to questions, doing more quizzes essentially with them? The second finding is that red bar graph on the left, which shows how students often prefer the things that actually aren't the most effective for them. And that suggests just because they like it, 
doesn't mean it's best for them, which means we probably need to explicitly teach them about the benefits of retrieval practice and indeed how to learn. And I look at these findings and these two main questions stand out, which I think are worth considering. The first is how do you weave retrieval practice more into your lessons? As I think it does depend on your context, your students and your subject. And the second question is, given that they don't often prefer retrieval practice, how do we get them using it more when it comes to independent study or when they're revising? And I think if we reflect on those two questions, we're using this study findings most effectively. Study number three looks at the power of high expectations and how having high expectations can really help enhance students' motivation and performance. This is study number three. In this research paper, researchers ask students to come into a lab and put them on a bike. You know, the sort of fixed bikes that you get in the gym and ask them to cycle for 4,000 meters as fast as they possibly could. So it was a race to exhaustion, asking them to put in 100% maximum effort. And then the researchers timed them to see how well they did. They then gave them a few days break to rest and recover. Then for round two, they got them back in the same lab, put them back on the same bike and asked them again to do 4,000 meters as fast as they possibly could. The only thing they changed for round two is that they let the students race in front of a screen which had an avatar of their previous go so that they could keep up with it and try and pace themselves. But of course, you can never trust psychologists when they run experiments. And what they hadn't told the students is that this avatar of their previous go had actually been sped up. And what did they find? Most students went faster in round two as they tried to keep up with this new enhanced speed. So why was this the case? Well, because their expectations of what could be achieved had been increased. Study number four is the seminal study on growth mindset. Growth mindset being, do students believe that their intelligence is fixed or something that can be developed? This is what the key research on growth mindset had to say. This is the seminal study on growth mindset and indeed the impact that growth mindset has on feedback. The way this study worked is that students were given a task, a sort of memory puzzle, and half the students were told that they did really well and so they must be really smart. So they were praised for their natural ability. Sentences like, you're such a smart boy, you're such a clever girl, you must be really intelligent to do well at this sort of task. These students were then given a choice as to what sort of feedback they would like from the researcher. These students were more likely to choose two types of feedback. The first wasn't really even feedback, it was more just praise, so the students wanted compliments to make them feel good about themselves. The second type of feedback a lot of these students wanted was if you praise someone for their intelligence, they then want to know, am I smarter than my friends? Essentially, how did Dave do on this sort of test? The other half of students were praised for their processes, their behaviour and their effort. So you did really well, you must have worked really hard on this sort of puzzle. When given the choice, an overwhelmingly large number of these students wanted feedback on how could I do the task better next time. And what makes this study really interesting was at the end of the day, the researchers asked the students to do one more sort of task and the students were given a choice. They could either do an easier one than they did in the morning, they could do the same sort of difficulty, or they could choose a harder task. Students who were praised for their natural ability were far more likely to choose an easier task, as that way they could end the day with their smart reputation intact because clever people always get things right. Whereas those who'd been praised for their behaviour and for their effort, they were much more likely to want to use the feedback they'd been given on how to do the task even better, and as a result, were much more likely to choose a harder task. And one of the interesting implications of this is as students get older in education, the decisions they make around their own independent learning become much more important. And this shows the link between praise, feedback, and that independent learning. This last study is really interesting as it highlights how we praise someone has a big impact on their mindset. And that's why at Inner Drive, we have coined the phrase purposeful praise. Purposeful praise describes how the only behavior worth praising 
is the ones we want to see again in the future. It's about working out what behaviours we value and looking for opportunities to praise them. That's why it doesn't make too much sense to praise students for their intelligence or their natural ability. It makes much more sense to focus on their behaviour. So instead of saying, you got 10 out of 10, well done, you must be really smart at this, far better to say, you got 10 out of 10, you must have put a lot of work and effort into this piece of work. By doing so, it provides a template for them on how to repeat that success. It gives them an understanding of how hard they need to work in order to achieve similar results. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and there are two possible consequences for getting the answers wrong. On one hand, if you get the answer wrong, you'll know that I will give you a mild electric shock. On the other hand, scenario two, if you get the answer wrong, you know that I might give you an electric shock. Which of these two do you find more stressful, knowing you'll definitely get an electric shock or knowing that you might get one if you get the answer wrong? I'll give you 15 seconds to decide your answer. If you chose the second option, you're in good company. Researchers from the University College London found that the uncertainty of maybe getting electric shock was actually more stressful than those who knew for sure that they definitely would. So it turns out that it's not the worst case scenario that worries us the most, but it's the not knowing that does. So there you have it, our five studies that we really like from our book, The Science of Learning. If you'd like to read more, please do get in touch with us. Or better yet, why not order our book on Amazon? And if you'd like a bulk discount for your school, you can get in touch and we'll sort that out as well. I really hope you enjoyed hearing about our book, The Science of Learning.